<laughs> My brother, being the inventive boy that he was, liked to build forts. They were mostly constructed of yardsticks and blankets, or whatever else he could get his hands on. When my mother saw us playing in there one day, she forbade it, as she feared I could suffocate myself. Even though I was seven at the time, I was very small for my age. I reluctantly agreed, and scampered off to play in my bedroom. I was playing with some dolls when a little boy walked in. Now, I don't know who or what this little boy was, but to me, he looked like a real person. I honestly thought that he was a friend of my brother's. Although he did seem a little bit young to be chumming around with my bro, I remember him asking me if I wanted to play. Being lonely and not having many friends, I quickly agreed and was happy to have a new playmate. He suggested playing in the fort. Now I knew I wasn't supposed to do that, but I was just so happy to have a new friend that I agreed and made a mental note to be extra careful while inside the fort. Almost as soon as we were inside the fort, the little boy told me that he had to go, but that I should wait there for him to come back in a little while. I have no idea how long I waited, but sometime later, I heard my entire family frantically calling my name, obviously searching for me. To this day, I have no idea why I didn't answer. Maybe I was afraid of being caught. I don't know. The blanket that was served as the door was yanked up, and I saw my mother's anxious face peering inside. Eventually, I explained the entire story to my parents. Although they believe me, the identity of that boy remains unknown, and I never saw him ever again. There were only five other families that lived in our street, and we knew all of the neighborhood children. It wasn't any of them. I kick myself now for not even asking the boy what his name was. That might have helped some. I've heard many stories on this in other sites, but I've never heard of anyone interacting with the ghost as I've just mentioned. Weird, huh? Thinking back on that little boy, the only thing that struck me as being a little bit weird is the way he moved. It was slow, yet fast, and his movements were jerky if that makes any sense. Also for a young boy, his voice was very mature and sounded very much like the voice of my father. I know it sounds truly bizarre, but I swear it happened. And even though it's been 20 years since this event took place, I still remember it as though it was yesterday. We stayed in that house for a total of five years, and as the years passed, Strange things continued to happen. My entire family suffered in one way or another from the haunting. My eldest sister suffered the most. But for the time being, I'll stick to my own stories. For Christmas one year, my aunt had given me a hideous green and orange stuffed clown whose nose would glow red and play a musical melody. At first glance, I hated this thing and quickly stuffed it in some dark recess in my closet. Sometime in the middle of the night I had awoken, desperately needing to use the restroom. The idea of walking through a darkened hallway at 3am was not a desirable prospect, but by this point, it was an absolute necessity. I made my way down the stairs, and was just about to round the corner into the living room, when I heard it. Soft jewelry box music was coming in the general direction of the living room. Peeking my way around the corner, I saw the stuffed Christmas clown propped up in the middle of the couch, its nose glowing in the darkness. I high-tilled it back upstairs, wetting myself in the process, and jumped in my bed, shaking like a leaf. It scared me half to death. Nothing scared me more in that house than the spirit who I dubbed the old man. I saw him many times both inside the house and also in the fields behind our house, just kind of standing there, staring intently up at the house. He always wore a brown business type suit and a top hat. I've always had nightmares about him over the years. Most of them would entail me being in a room with my back to the doorway. Instinctively, my back would tense. 
I would spin around, and he would pounce, charging at me full speed from the other end of the room, sometimes carrying an axe, or sometimes not. One thing that sticks out in these dreams is that he somehow was more vivid and colorful than the rest of his surroundings. He always seems to stand out, if you know what I mean. I always felt that he was standing right behind me on the staircase, ready to give me a good push. Indeed, I did fall down those stairs many, many times, no matter how careful I was. But luckily, I was never seriously injured. I know this sounds crazy, and heck, the whole story sounds crazy, but I think he used to like to hang out in my walk-in closet and hiss so loudly that it almost sounded like a rattlesnake. I think he got a kick out of scaring me, as he liked to turn the lights out on me. When he walked down into the basement, there was only one switch for the entire area situated to the left of the door as you were heading downstairs. Now, I hated to go down there for anything, but it was a must on this day because our fridge had burned out once again and dying apparitions were a big problem in this house. Seeing as the only other working fridge was in the basement, my mother asked me to go down there to get some necessary items for dinner that evening. I ran down the steps to the refrigerator, grabbed whatever it was I was supposed to get, and bam, the lights went out. I started screaming and ran for the stairs, absolutely certain that he was hot on my trails. As I was finally reaching for the door, I heard it, and I swear I will never forget this. Laughter, but not just any laughter. This laughter literally chilled me to the bone. It was somehow evil and mocking as if to say, I missed you this time, but next time, you may not be so lucky. Needless to say, I was spooked. I'm not sure who it was who was laughing, but I do know that the laughter was male, and only my mother and I were at home at the time. At some point, a shadow also began to show up on our living room wall. My sister and I were watching a movie one night when I first saw it, and there was no mistaking it. This shadow was definitely of a person, and somehow darker and more opaque, than what a regular shadow should be. We moved everything around that room, shaking our hands in front of it, trying to figure out its origin or what it might be causing it to no avail. That shadow appeared in the same spot every night until we moved from that home, sometimes disappearing for a few hours, only to reappear sometime later. I think the guys also like to mess around with the phone lines. Many times when you would pick up the phone, all you could hear was the static, or there might be a couple of voices in the background, although you could never make out exactly what they were saying. On one occasion, I picked up the phone only to hear ear-shattering static, before I had enough time to put the receiver back on its cradle. I heard a man say hello, in a slightly, okay, very mocking manner, and then that same god dang laughter. That really scared me. Other people, including my grandmother, reported calling her home, and a strange man would answer. A second later, the phone would start to ring normally, and one of us would eventually answer. This to say this unnerved me to no end. Once, and only once, I was upstairs in my bedroom listening to the stereo with a girlfriend of mine on one of those perfect, sunny Southern California afternoons. We were kind of goofing off singing along when a man's voice started to come through the radio. Believe me when I say, this was no radio broadcast. The language was foul and violent, much too obscene to be repeated here. My friend and I just stared at each other, becoming more frightened by the minute. When I finally couldn't take it anymore, I reached over and pulled the plug, thinking that would put an end to the disturbing episode. To my complete astonishment, the radio just kept on playing. Okay, playtime is over. Time to head to my friend's house. I really don't know how to explain this, but somehow we learned to live with these things as a family. I got used to being afraid, expecting things to go missing. 
I barely glanced if a door slammed on its own, or a light mysteriously came on. I expected to hear my name being called out in the middle of the night, and so on. Was I still scared? Um, yeah. Deathly terrified might be a better term, but somehow, I managed to live with it. Maybe these ghosts or spirits or whatever you wanted to call them, sensed that, and decided to turn it up a notch. Now, I'm not really sure what happened next, because my father-in-law is now deceased, and refused to talk about this with anyone other than my mother. And she, too, refuses to discuss this. All I know is that my two sisters, my brother and my mother and I, traveled to Arizona for four days to visit my grandmother leaving my father in the house by himself. Something obviously happened, which really spooked my father. One night, I eavesdropped on one of the conversations that my dad was having with my mother, and all I could really make out was something about borrowed time, all of the windows opening at once, and an old man. The very next day, my father decided that we were moving as soon as possible and was putting the house up for sale. With that being said, the entire family decided to go out for dinner and celebrate. Upon returning home, something caught my eye that was sort of strange. A single light was burning in my parents' bedroom. Now, if you know my father, you would know that he was a complete stickler about leaving the lights on. The number one rule in my house was to shut the lights off as soon as you left a room. A light burning in my parents' bedrooms of all places was quite odd. As soon as our father unlocked the front door, our two dogs went rushing out. I thought I was going to have a heart attack at 12 years of age. On further inspection, it seemed as though the dogs had literally tried to chew their way out of the front door, given the huge bite and scratch marks all over the front door. As soon as my father flicked on the lights, I gasped. It's kind of hard to describe what I saw. The entire house was in disarray. The living room couch was standing on its side. Lamps were broken. Mirrors shattered. Drawers yanked out of the kitchen cabinets. Silver was strewn all over the floor. My father was convinced that someone had broken into the home. We were told to remain outside the house while my brother and mother walked to a neighbor's house to call the police. This was before cell phones. The police arrived somewhere between a half hour to an hour later. An actual police report is documented concerning these reports. The police checked the doors and windows for signs of an intruder, dusted for prints, talked to our neighbors, and checked the house thoroughly for anyone who might be still lurking around. Their investigation turned out nothing. My father ordered us all upstairs to pack up some belongings. We weren't staying. As I was heading into my bedroom, I happened to glance into my parents' room and noticed that the lamp sitting on my father's nightstand was starting to burn wallpaper behind it. I don't know if this was just my nerves or what, but it honestly looked as though there was a pattern of a burn that was turning into a face. The face of none other than the old man who had been haunting me for years. As I was standing there looking at it, my mother came up behind me and gasped. I think she saw the same thing as I did. When I arrived at my grandmother's house later on in that evening, I heard my mom and dad discussing my grandmother with some of the things that had just happened. If I had known these things while living there, there is no way I would have gotten even one night of sleep there. Not that I did anyways. It's now been over 20 years since I've lived in that home. Yet it still continues to haunt me, considering the fact that we lived in the house for just over five years. Numerous other events took place that I haven't included, but it's hard to fit the five years of living into a single submission. The house is still standing, and I occasionally drive by just for kicks. The house has been almost completely renovated from the outside, and often when I drive by, I see the for sale sign perched up on the front lawn. It seems as though no one stays in the house for too long. It's interesting to note that I've never again experienced anything ghostly or otherworldly since leaving that home.
That remains my one and only true experience with the other side. I am a restaurant manager in a small town in Georgia, Millage. Now I have to mention that the building this restaurant is in was brand new when we opened. About seven months after we opened the doors the first time to the public, it all started. At that time, I was promoted into management and took over second shift. The employees and me started to see a shadow figure walking in the back of the home, always by the ice machine and dry storage room. One day, I was carrying a glass rack to the dish room. When the swinging door that separates the dining room from the back of the home opened and stayed open until I walked through the door and put the rack down by itself. This is a swinging door that we just push open with our foot to walk through. It swipes right back, except for that time. As I walked through the door, I looked and saw no one by the door that could have opened it for me. At that time, all I had was one server who was taking an order in the dining room at the time. One cook that was on the grill line cooking an order, and me, no dishwasher yet. Things have been progressing over the last three years. When I walked out of my office one night after closing, the dish cart started rolling from the swinging door to the dining room, right in front of me. I was the only one left in the building. Now things are starting to happen in the front of the house. I now am running shifts during the day, from 5.30 in the morning to 3 or 4 p.m. depending. Glass racks are coming out of their slots by themselves. One time a rack came completely out of its slot and fell on the floor, with only one server there, and she was nowhere near it. She got scared when she saw that. We always see a shadow figure walk around in the dining room now, also on the grill line, and then back to the dry storage room. All the employees had some kind of something happen that neither one of us can explain, but don't get a bad feeling when anything happens, and we just named the shadow figure George. We also talked to George a lot. When asked to please stop moving things, it stops, if only for that day. We all sure would like to know what's going on here, and how did George come into a brand new building to stay? Nothing too scary, I know. They are not all scary. I think ghosts are just people like us. This is an account of a shadow person. I was sat in the dark in a security lodge which is mostly made of windows. About 3 a.m., I turned and noticed the shadow of what I thought was a man looking into the lodge window from the outside. When I looked at the shadow, it turned slowly and walked to the side, which would have put the person making the shadow move into the open road. Surprised that there would be anyone there at this hour, I looked out of the window and saw nobody. I looked around the lodge, but nobody was around. It began to strike me as strange. I did the usual thing of checking to see if it could have been an anomaly caused by automobile lights, etc. But there were no automobiles around or any other light source's probable cause. There was something about the shadow that just struck me as odd. The shadow was the presence. It did not seem to cast by another presence. I could not think of anything that would attract such a being, so I just put it down to experience. However, a while later I was on a website where a woman with knowledge of a shadow person was explaining that they enjoy hanging around illness and death. A work colleague at the time had his wife seriously ill with some illness, like Alzheimer's or something, and he would bring her to work as she could not be left alone. We work alone, so there is no problem with bringing a wife like that. Around the time I saw the shadow person, his wife died at home. Had the shadow person got into the habit of visiting the lodge to watch events there? I'm not sure. I want to start off by saying that this is a great site, and I love reading about everyone's ghostly experiences, even though I must admit I have a hard time believing them all. There's some stories that you can just tell. The person writing it is a kid with an overactive imagination. I only say this because even though I am a believer, I am a college educational rational individual, 
and I can also be the biggest skeptic you've ever met. Which brings me to this incident that occurred while I was still in college. I just wanted to stress to everyone that's as skeptical as I am, that even though this experience sounds extremely unbelievable, that this is true and it really did happen. I know that this is long, but bear with me. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. This experience happened one late night in October in 1994. I was a junior in college at the time and had very little free time to do anything because besides class, I also worked part time and was very active in my fraternity. Every year, we would have a big Halloween party at one of our fraternity brother's houses and just have a completely wild, chaotic night, but nothing can compare to what we all experienced that night. I got to the party shortly after it started, got a beer, and noticed people coming out of the basement. I asked one of the people what was going on down there, and they told me that my friend Jeff had brought his Ouija board to the party and was down there, acting stupid. Apparently, these people didn't know Jeff very well. He took the Ouija very seriously. If anything, he was addicted to it. He constantly used it and kept people in close contact with a spirit named Jack that he contacted through the board. I'd come to learn that Jack was in the most pleasant spirit and was a pretty mean individual who had died in prison, but for some reason, Jeff liked conversing with him. I then proceeded down the stairs to see what was going on. There was about 10 people down in the basement. By the way, this was not a finished basement. This was the spooky concrete floors and dust everywhere basement. Jeff and a girl I knew named Lynn were using the board and talking to Jeff. Lynn began getting tired of it. She was just trying to have a good time and she thought that Jeff was taking the whole thing way too seriously. Before she could get up to go back upstairs, a girl we knew named Dana came down the stairs. As soon as Dana came down into the basement, the board went absolutely nuts, moving around at a frenzied pace. Jeff said that this wasn't like Jack and asked the board what was wrong. The board spelled out that it wasn't Jack, and it just kept spelling Dana's name over and over. Jeff asked the board if the spirit knew Dana, and it said yes. At this point, everyone's kind of looking around confused and everything, and Dana was just looking at the board all weird. Jeff then asked the board what its name was, as it spelled out the name Michael, and that he was six years old when he died. This is when Dana went ballistic. She just started crying uncontrollably and shouting but we couldn't understand her because she was crying so much. She then ran upstairs and out the back door. A couple of us followed her to try and find out what was going on and to try and calm her down. We went outside and saw Dana crying on another girl's shoulder. This other girl looked both pissed off and scared to death at the same time. We asked her what was wrong and started yelling at us. How could you dare pull a mean trick like that? You should feel awful for doing this to her. We were clueless. We asked her what she was talking about, and then she told us that Dana had a younger brother named Michael that drowned when he was six years old. A chill immediately went down my spine. Once Dana calmed down a little bit, she told us that she'd been trying to contact Michael over the years, but was never able to. She then offered to buy Jeff's Ouija board from him so he could keep in touch with her brother. At this time, Jack came back, and it was like he and Michael were fighting over control of the board. Jack then told Jeff that if he burned the board that night before midnight, that his soul would be set free and he would be at peace. Jeff immediately wanted to set the board on fire because he said he developed some sort of relationship with Jack and wanted his soul to be at peace. Let's just say Dana didn't like that idea a bit, so they both got in a huge argument and the party became totally chaotic. By this time, everyone at the party, only about 50 people, knew what was going on and everyone started fighting and yelling, split down the middle either on Jeff's side or Dana's. Eventually, Jeff snuck outside with a can of lighter fluid and set the board on fire with Dana standing over it and crying her eyes out. As you can guess, no one was really in the mood to party after that and everyone ended up either staying at the house the party was at or left for home to get their head back together. After that night, not one person I know that was at this party ever talked about that night again, not even once. 
I don't know how to explain what happened, but all I know is that there's no way that this was some sort of trick or joke that Jeff and Dana could have played on us. Being the skeptic that I am to this day, I tried to find out just how they could have pulled this over on us. Dana was just a friend of a friend of a friend that not very many of us knew that well, and that night at the party, none of us knew that she had a brother. Just that one friend of hers at a party that yelled at us knew anything about it. And then there's Jeff. He just takes the occult way too seriously, but would never use it as a basis for a joke. And if it was a trick, he's not the type to let it go. He'd make sure he knew it in our face about how much he scared us and what a great joke it was every chance he got. That's just how he is. To this day, anytime I tell anyone about this, when I get to the part that the spirit was her brother, I get a chill all over my body. Words simply can't describe what it is like being that night and what happened, but I'll never forget about it. I can remember it was just like it was yesterday. If anyone wants to write me about this or anything, feel free to. Yesterday, life was such an easy game to play. I would upload a lot of times. Oh, yesterday was back in 20... 15 something like that suddenly i'm not uploading like i used to do there's a youtuber who hates me now oh that's a lot even if it's just one why you had a copyright strike, I don't know, YouTube wouldn't say. I've done something wrong, now I long for YouTube's monetization policy. Coppa got me in the butt today. Can't even say the ASS word because it's not family friendly. Why you sign off of YouTube without giving this video a like? You wouldn't even say, you wouldn't even comment or subscribe. Now I long for the days when I could grow a lot. And this is a weird ending to a video that I wouldn't know.